All right, welcome back to a session on the Jade Treaty, um, sort of a continuation of some of the stuff we talked about this morning. I think we have about an hour and 15 minutes or so, and then we'll have a short break, and then the Pacificus Helvidius discussion, uh, then I think we'll conclude. So we'll, we'll move, um, move through things here. Several points to make just up front about the, the Jay Treaty debate, which we'll be talking about. This is sort of, again, um, the continuation of so many of the things we talked about this morning. The broad general viewpoints about foreign policy that the Federalists had and the Democratic Republicans had. So keep all that in your mind. Um, the fallout and the way that the Federalists had really been able to sort of manipulate the debate over neutrality in a way that clearly favored them putting Janae up against George Washington, drawing the comparison, and the way that the Democratic Republicans, with Jefferson's insight, sort of wisely were able to recognize that was a losing battle to pull back from that and sort of regroup to reestablish that partisan equilibrium that we talked about at the end of 1793 and then move on to, to other issues. So politics continued to rage during 1794 in the debates over the Democratic societies, <coughs> And, of course, the actions of a number of western Pennsylvania farmers known as the Whiskey Rebels, or as some people call them, the Whiskey Regulators, a more positive way of thinking about them, trying to assert their uh, democratic independence and things like that against the heavy hand of Hamiltonian federalism. So <clears throat> much of 1794 early on was uh, the country was divided badly over domestic policies and issues. But what was also going on in 1794 was the continuation of this broader, long-running foreign policy struggle the U.S. was having with two European nations that were at war. And the United States, as um, many people feared would happen, was drawn into this contest, not as a participant, but was clearly directed, clearly involved, rather, because U.S. shipping was often a target of harassment and seizures and impressment by both the English and the French. So in this, the United States in 1794, despite declaring neutrality, found in many ways that neither of the combatants, the British or the French, would let the U.S. be neutral. In a sense, the U.S. could say, we're neutral, we don't have a dog in this fight, we're not getting involved. But the U.S., in fact, was being involved because of the way this, uh, these attacks on U.S. shipping on the high seas in the Atlantic actually worked. The problem grew to be so great and was also tied to a general desire by the Federalist Administration to make even closer ties commercially with the British that John Jay, uh, who of course, as John said this morning, was uh, first Chief Justice, um, was asked by, um, by George Washington to go to the British and work out a comprehensive deal involving commerce, involving cleaning up some of the leftover issues from the Revolutionary War, and also involving American issues like uh, impressment of sailors, but also slaves that had been carried off uh, and freed during the war as well. So there were a number of outstanding issues that were to be worked out here. Uh, and the fact that John Jay was asked to undertake this mission and the fact that he accepted, I think tells us everything we need to know about how serious these matters were and how serious Washington was about sending not just a good diplomat, but arguably the best diplomat to undertake this procedure. I think it also shows, because Jay did hold, uh, I think, generally those Federalist, pro-British foreign policy orientations, it shows pretty clearly that the expectation was that Jay would work out some sort of terms that would be beneficial to the U.S., as beneficial as might be obtained, in an asymmetric power relationship that clearly favored the British, but that it would also be done in a way that would maintain peace and, in fact, deepen and strengthen the peace and the relationship between the two countries. The treaty is after, it's, it's known colloquially as Jay's Treaty or the Jay Treaty, but the technical name is the Treaty of Amity and Commerce, which is not an original name, certainly. Others had, had, had borne that name, but it does suggest that the real goals here are furthering amity and the sense of, of cohesiveness and, and collegiality, and also commerce and trade. So in many ways, I think the backdrop to the Jay Treaty negotiations has everything to do with the conflicts that we've already talked about that were uh, an onset of the 
of the new nation and the diplomacy of the new nation. And perhaps most of all, the Jay Treaty was necessitated by the fact of how the U.S. was trying to get along in a very dangerous world in which the U.S. was being involved against its will by both of the major combatants in the struggle between the British and the French. The treaty was negotiated by Jay uh, in 1794, and the negotiations went on intermittently. As I mentioned this morning, I think, this was a, a huge deal for the United States and clearly was their top foreign policy priority. But the British obviously had other more pressing issues for them. The war with France, their other relationships, their broader concerns around the world and around the globe. And so Jay was often being put off, often delayed. The, uh, his British counterparts would meet with him for a few days and then go away and do other things and keep Jay waiting. And Jay often uh, uh, was there with his son and often um, went to parties and dinners and social events, all of which would come back to haunt him in a way because the treaty critics would hold this against him during the public debate on the treaty uh, later that year and the next year and then into 1796, suggesting he had been somehow less attentive or had been hoodwinked by the British or had been um, uh, won over in some ways by his close relationship with them in a way that tainted his, his negotiating strategy to become clearly more pro-British than, than pro-American. But again, the Jay Treaty um, itself is not purely of the realm of foreign policy, but it is also, I think, part of the realm of domestic politics because, as I suggested this morning, everything that happened in foreign policy now by the mid-1790s was being viewed through the lens of rising partisanship and the growth of these two political parties, neither of which existed and neither of which had really been imagined at the time of the uh, framing in 1787 and ratification that year in 1788. Those divisions between Federalist and Anti-Federalist um, were, were thought by many to be temporary only over the Constitution, and so the political parties obviously didn't exist in 1789, and these are uh, relatively new in the making. And yet nonetheless, I think I would suggest it's those political partisan identities that really shaped the way people thought about foreign policy. And as I said this morning, if you were a Federalist, you tended to lean toward the British, understand the world through their point of view, because you were in many ways hoping that the United States would become more like the British, uh, a major commercial, financial, manufacturing nation, and a power that could command great respect in uh, both uh, military and also financial needs. And if you opposed the British and supported the French, then your orientation would be obviously quite different. And I think these perspectives colored the way people thought not only about the Jay Treaty, but even more basically how they thought about Great Britain and how they thought about France, even before Jay was sent over on this mission. And the expectation, again, uh, based on your orientation, based on your political party affiliation, was one that would, be, would really color everything that you would think about uh, when you got the news of the treaty. Now, one of the things about Jay's negotiations, which I want to get into a little bit more here in a minute, is that the only knowledge of this that Americans had were from very few tidbits that came out and were sporadically published about the treaty and the negotiations. No one really knew for sure. And because this was not something that took place in a fixed period of time and then was over, because it kept going on with delays and periods of uh, pause in between, American newspapers in 1794 were filled with speculation about the treaty, some hoping that it would be a great treaty, that we'd get everything we asked for, a reestablishment of the commercial ties we wanted, a strong statement of amity and friendship, a building of even closer ties between the U.S. and Great Britain, and a resolution of those outstanding issues that had been there, in many cases, left over from the revolution. Now, others, primarily leaning to the Democratic-Republican side, expected that the treaty would be a sellout, that it would be uh, a bending over backwards to the British to excuse and tolerate and give them everything possible, everything they might want. And so some of the people who were on the Democratic-Republican side essentially were anti-treaty critics even before there was a treaty. 
they were already prepared to dislike whatever Jay negotiated because Jay was clearly identified with Hamilton and clearly identified with a Federalist administration and clearly identified with a pro-British foreign policy. And so because of that, many of the people on the emerging Democratic-Republican side were already prepared not to like whatever the results of Jay's negotiation might be and already were deeply skeptical that anything, that he would be even capable of producing a treaty that they might like in any way, shape, or form. And so you had in the newspapers only speculation, but it ran to, to both extremes. This will be a great treaty. Jay will get us everything we could ever ask for. Or this will be a sellout. It will confirm our worst fears. It will be a disaster for the United States and for American freedom. Now, again, until there actually was a treaty, no one <coughs> could or did know. But the expectations were already being aroused, and I think that suggests something about how interested the American reading public, however large that may have been, was in this negotiation. Jay's mission, again, was a big deal. And the issues between the two countries were considered big deals. And the need to resolve some of these were considered very important pressing matters as well. And so even when the newspapers didn't have any hard news to report, they would still report quite a bit of speculation about how the treaty might be good or bad and why and what that might mean. Now, in some ways, I guess one of the easiest or simplest things to say about the Jay Treaty is that it had its origins in trying to clean up some unresolved issues from the American Revolutionary War. There were still some ways in which, even 11 years later, there were issues from the American Revolutionary War supposedly settled by the 1783 treaty, which in fact were not yet really settled. The British, for example, had promised to vacate their forts. I think about nine forts in the, the West. They had promised to do this in the treaty of 1783, but they had still not done so. Now, for their part, they argued that they didn't have to do that because Americans had not made good on all of their promises in the treaty either, particularly recomping, uh, recompensating loyalists for land that was lost and taken in the American Revolution. So the British were holding on to the forts, they said, for leverage, and they suggested that when the Americans fulfilled their obligations that the 1783 committee, uh, treaty had committed them to, they would be happy to fulfill theirs by abandoning the forts. But this, of course, was an issue that really rubbed Americans in a very insulting way. This was a clear example of how weak the U.S. was and of how the U.S. could urge the British to evacuate the forts, could hold up the treaty and say, hey, look, you, you promised to, to, get, to get out of there, and yet you haven't. And yet the Americans couldn't and wouldn't force them to do so. So the treaty is, the, the, the forts issue and the, the failure of the British to evacuate the forts was considered a major um, uh, source of insult and a good example of American impotence in the face of the British and their power and strength. Now these smaller slights were also joined by more aggressive actions that broke out when Great Britain and France went to war in 1793. A British order in council from November of 1793 had ordered the British Navy to seize any ship carrying goods or produce to French ports. Any ship carrying goods or produce to French ports, which included quite a number of American ships. Adding insult to injury, the British seized the ships first and only told the United States about the policy after the fact. So this was a clear, brazen act that simply was a statement by the British we know you don't like this, we know this isn't right, but we know you can't do anything about it, so who cares? It was, again, a brazen act of British power designed to humiliate the United States. And that's exactly how it was seen by many Americans. This was deeply embarrassing to the Federalist, deeply embarrassing to Hamilton, for example, because Hamilton and the uh, Federalists were obviously pro-British, but here was clearly our great ally, the country we're trying to emulate, treating us with the backs of their hands. 
treating us with such disrespect and contempt in a manner that's really embarrassing that pointed up that enormous power differential between the British and the Americans. Now, on top of that, by March of 1794, by March of 1794, more than 250 American merchant ships had been detained by the British. More than 250 American merchant ships had been detained by the British. And in some cases, they impressed sailors. In other cases, they took cargoes. They pretty much did what they wanted to because they knew they could. And these were issues, along with the forts and along with the general attitude that the British seemed to be showing the Americans of, we'll do what we want to do, and it just doesn't matter because you can't make us do anything different. That the hope was that Jay could negotiate some way to shift this, some way to change this in a way that would be better for the, uh, for the Americans. There was broad agreement by both Federalist and Democratic Republicans that the United States had to go address this, that this required a diplomatic mission. This was not the thing that could be done um, in sort of informal back channel ways. This required a serious diplomatic mission because these were very serious violations of American sovereignty, of American neutrality. They were also very serious violations of the 1783 treaty, many Americans said. So the clear belief was that even though political partisans disagreed about what the mission should do or who the ideal diplomat would be to go, they did clearly believe that we needed a mission, that the U.S. had to send someone and had to negotiate. Federalists like Hamilton, who again, as we said this morning, had once told George Beckwith, we think in English. Hamilton had largely crafted the negotiating instructions for John Jay. But Jay was given quite a bit of latitude because of the trust that the administration had in him and because of Jay's vast experience as a diplomat. I mean, he was the, the top shelf guy. So although he went with a set of instructions crafted by Hamilton for what he was supposed to be doing, he was also given a fairly wide degree of latitude in the belief that he would do the right thing, that he would be able to, to take particulars and fit them into a broader plan, and that Jay could certainly be trusted not to do anything foolish and to come out with the best deal possible. Hamilton and the Federalist as I said before, were realist. They understood the relative weakness of the U.S. They understood that the U.S. could not demand that the British do anything and that they had almost no leverage to use against the British to try to get them to fulfill the terms of the 1783 treaty or to do anything new that they wanted as well. And so because of that, they were, again, as I said this morning, willing to fit the Jay Treaty negotiations into that broader framework of tolerating British actions that were not favorable to the U.S., but to do so because they saw that as a short-term means toward a long-term goal of becoming stronger and, and, and more powerful over time. So in the Jay Treaty negotiations, as in other matters, this was one of those examples where Federalists believed that the, the, the better part of valor here was to give in when you need to, negotiate for what can be gotten, get as much as you can, but also to realize that you're not going to be able to force the British to do anything they're not prepared to do. And that that would be an unwise move to make at this time because the U.S. was not ready to back that up with anything more forceful. So that general framework that I mentioned this morning also very much colored the treaty instructions that Jay had in negotiating this agreement with Great Britain. The sense that the U.S. needed to give in to the British, needed to be uh, tolerant of giving away seemingly a lot of concessions now in the hopes that in time the U.S. would be strong enough to be able to stand up to the British and negotiate from a much better position of strength. On the other side, the Democratic Republicans, as you can imagine, saw this as a great opportunity to stick it to the British and to basically say, look, you've promised us in this treaty that you'll evacuate the forts. Do it. You are seizing our ships and detaining our sailors and impressing our sailors on the high seas in violation of, of all the, accept, the accepted rules. Don't do that anymore. Stop doing that. We're in the right, Democratic Republicans thought, and because we have right on our side, we should be able to force the British to back down from their obviously wrong actions. <clears throat> 
Now this too fit part and parcel as part of that Republican foreign policy perspective that tends to be against the British, that tends to be anti-British in orientation, that tends to see the British as this monarchical power bent on tyrannical despotism that is trying to knuckle under the United States even though they're no longer colonies but a separate nation, that behavior, they argued, had not changed. And so from the Republican perspective, in looking at the Jay mission and the issues that that brought into play, their perspective was, we're in the right, we need to be forceful with them, don't apologize, don't back down. And Republicans were skeptical that Jay would either be willing or able to do that because they saw Jay as essentially Hamilton's tool. They saw Jay as essentially doing Hamilton's bidding and Hamilton's bargaining for the Federalist. And again, from the Republican standpoint, the U.S. didn't need to and shouldn't back down. After all, it was the British who were violating the treaty, the British whose actions were clearly wrong on the high seas. So why shouldn't the Americans push for a favorable resolution of those issues? Why shouldn't they hold the British to account? What's wrong with standing up and being forceful and standing up for American sovereign rights? In other words, the Republicans saw Jay's mission, saw this diplomatic mission as a perfect opportunity to very boldly assert American neutral rights, to very boldly assert all the principles of free trade and free ships, and to rebuke the British for their violations of those. Now, what did Hamilton tell Jay? What were the instructions that Jay was supposed to give? Again, those were sort of the broad foreign policy partisan outlooks of what people thought about the treaty ahead of time. But in terms of the actual instructions, here's what Jay was told. He was instructed to seek indemnification, to seek compensation from the British for their seizures of American ships. So he was told to seek some sort of indemnification or compensation from the British for their seizures of American ships. You've stopped over 250 ships, you have seized cargoes, we want to be compensated for that. You should, you should make that good what you've done. Another key element of his instructions, he should push the British and essentially in the strongest possible terms say, evacuate the Western forts. You've held them long enough. It's been 11 years now. You've promised to give them up in 1783. We need those forts. It's a matter of sovereignty. I mean, after all, here are British troops in forts on American soil. And this was, uh, for Americans, not only an insult, but a violation of their, their sovereignty. Jay was also told to ask for a more, uh, a broader or a more liberal reading of neutral trading rights in time of war to give Americans more latitude to trade with other nations, to trade with warring nations, and to find some way to, again, give Americans greater access to more and more markets, rather than being restricted and hemmed in, not only by British seizures, but by British economic pressure as well. So another key element of his instructions was to fight for, or push for a, a broader or more liberal reading of neutral shipping rights in time of war. And one of the most important economic parts of this Treaty of Amity and Commerce would be to get the British to grant U.S. ships access to enter the very valuable, lucrative West Indian trade market. The West Indies were an enormous source of revenue for a number of European nations, and Americans wanted access to that, which the British had refused to grant. So one of the major commercial aspects of Jay's Treaty was to be opening more access for American ships in the West Indies. So those were some of the particular points that Jay was supposed to negotiate, but maybe at the bottom of all that was for Jay to, uh, to simply reassert and reestablish the very firm ties of friendship between the two nations. Remember, Republicans have been attacking Great Britain for several years now. They have been attacking British policies and measures. They've been attacking the Federalists for being pro-British. What the Federalists really wanted was to very firmly make it clear that we are allied with the British, that we're not ever going to go to war with them, that we have a firm trading relationship, we have a firm commercial relationship, 
We have a firm cultural relationship, and we are uh, closely aligned with them in every way conceivable, which made perfect sense for the Federalist, but of course was unacceptable to the Democratic Republicans. And so Jay's mission was meant to achieve that very stable and secure peace between the two countries. Now Jay left with these instructions on his mission in May of 1794. And he had uh, cordial but very sporadic meetings with British diplomats over the next several months. As I said, they frequently kept him waiting or could not meet him more than a few days in a row. But finally, by November of 1794, Jay and the British had signed a treaty, the Treaty of Amity and Commerce, but forever known as since as Jay's Treaty. This November 1794 treaty contained 28 articles, 28 articles that addressed in some way pretty much everything Jay was supposed to address. So it pretty much covered the ground of his instructions, though in terms that were um, uh, not at all what some people had expected. 28 articles. The very first pledged peace and a true and sincere friendship between the two countries. Now for the Federalists, that's exactly what they wanted. But for the Republicans, that's an insult. That's terrible. We don't want peace and a true and sincere friendship with the British. They're a monarchy. They're terrible. They're harassing us. We don't want that at all. But that was the first term of the treaty. The third article of the treaty pledged that citizens of a nation could pass freely across boundary lines in order to trade. That the U.S. and the British could pass freely across boundary lines, uh, meaning Canada and North America, um, in order to trade with the other. And this free access would be a way of reestablishing the sense that these are friendly nations, they're working toward the same goal, they have a common goal in mind. The second article of the treaty gave Jay one of his principal goals, the withdrawal of British troops from the Western forts by June 1st of 1796. Now again, that had been promised in 1783, but the Jay Treaty now made it clear as the second article that by June 1st, 1796, the British were pledging to abandon the Western forts. Other articles of the treaty suggested some of the grounds on which Jay and his British counterparts were not quite able to reach a final agreement in 1794. And so there were articles that established a series of joint commissions between the British and the Americans to deal with some of the issues that just simply couldn't be resolved in 1794, but which both parties agreed to say, yeah, we need to figure this out. Let's set up some joint commissions, and we'll sit down and talk about these at a future date. We agree they have to be resolved. We can't do it right now, but we'll set this up for the future. Now, uh, some of those issues had to do mostly with commercial matters and with trade, and especially with access to trade. Because again, for the U.S. to become the commercial trading power that it wanted to be, it had to have access to other ports and other nations. And the British had long been unwilling to grant that access that they had been able to hold themselves. So some of those issues, again, simply couldn't be resolved by Jay, and these committees and, and um, uh, joint commissions were designed to do that. On that line, or along those lines, the most problematic article of the Jay Treaty was Article 12, which opened the West Indian trade to the U.S., which again was one of Jay's instructions. That's part of what Jay was sent there to do. Article 12 actually gave the U.S. access to the West Indian trade, but only to ships of 70 tons or less, which actually is incredibly restrictive because it means essentially small ships without much cargo can go back and forth, but you can't bring much or carry much in or out on those, and so the amounts of revenue will be lower, and so the real access to the West Indian trade is still being restricted. Article 12, um, again, uh, was very severely restrictive. So Jay could say, on the one hand, I got what you asked me to get, access to the West Indian trade, but in such a way that, that really rendered that clearly a disappointment and clearly a, a problem. Now, looking at this, what Jay negotiated at the 28 articles and what he did, and considering the balance of power between the two nations, 
most diplomatic historians who have studied Jay's treaty, uh, Gerald Combs, Bradford Perkins, and many others, have argued that Jay pretty much got about as much as he could have, and that it's doubtful that any other negotiator could have gotten more. After all, the British knew Jay, they respected him, they liked him. Jay was as good a diplomat as the United States had, and if Jay got the most he could get, it is unlikely that anyone else could have obtained more. Now that's the verdict of Federalists at the time, even though they had hoped for more. And that's the verdict of many diplomatic historians since. But of course it was not the verdict of Democratic Republicans at the time, who said, we told you, sell out. We knew this would happen. We told you Jay would go there, give the British everything, knuckle under, and this is exactly what we think happened. Now treaties, and this is where one of the places where the Jay Treaty became also a test of unfolding the Constitution. And what does the Constitution actually mean? And how do we know what it means? And how do we unlock that meaning? The treaty, as treaties were supposed to do, went to the Senate to be debated and talked about in secret. The Senate, in meeting on this, was in some ways disappointed with many of the terms of the treaty and completely disappointed with Article 12, the one about West Indian trade being limited to ships of under 70 tons. And so they rejected that article. They approved the treaty, but they rejected that article. After several weeks of debate, on June 24th of 1795, June 24th of 1795, the Senate voted narrowly to approve the treaty. The vote was 20 to 10, which is exactly two-thirds. I mean, there was literally, and I'm using that word correctly, literally not a vote to spare. 20 to 10 was the approval, and Article 12 was rejected. The Senate was infuriated by Article 12 and the condescension and the superiority that it obviously seemed to contain. The lack of respect for Americans, the lack of respect for their position, all of this led many senators to being infuriated by the treaty and even disappointed with the results. But now the question of course became would George Washington sign this? Washington himself was disappointed with the treaty. He thought it should have been better. He had hoped that Jay would be able to get more. He was very disappointed with the 12th article. And after having held the treaty in secret for several months, even before he sent it to the Senate, Washington was now prepared, the Washington administration was now preparing to publish its contents. But here, Washington and the administration were scooped by what scholars believe was the first newspaper scoop and leak in history. Um, the first great newspaper scoop when the Republican newspaper of Benjamin Franklin Bates, the Philadelphia Aurora, obtained a copy of the treaty leaked by one of Virginia's senators who took this treaty that had been debated in secret, gave it to the uh, Republican newspaper, and an extract of the Jay Treaty. An extract was published on June 29th. Now that's just five days after the vote, on June 29th, and it was two days before the administration had planned to publish the treaty. So the administration basically said, we know this won't be popular, but we're going to go ahead and put it out there anyway and publish it. But they were beaten to the punch by Bates' newspaper. And what that scoop and the early publication did was to touch off the incredible series of protests against the treaties that culminated in the kinds of things that are shown on the cover of the Jay Treaty book that you have, of John Jay being burned in effigy around the country, and of the treaty being burned in effigy around the country. The leak itself seemed to suggest that the Federalists knew this was a terrible treaty and were trying to keep it secret, because although they had actually planned to publish it on July 1st, the fact that it had been leaked and published ahead of time suggested somehow the Federalists were hiding this and didn't want this to get out, that uh, the Virginia Senator Stevens Mason and Benjamin Bates's newspaper had done a great patriotic service by uncovering this dastardly deed by the Federalist administration and exposing uh, their, their negotiations and the bad news of the treaty. Immediately, in that first week of July, Republican critics uh, excoriated the treaty in their strongest possible language. And of course, as you know, the first week of July includes the celebration of the 4th, 
which was held up by many Republicans as, this treaty betrays the 4th of July. It betrays American independence. It betrays the spirit of the revolution. It betrays everything the country stands for. The timing was particularly favorable for anti-treaty activists. Opponents very quickly organized angry public meetings. Now again, these public meetings, we had seen those in the debate <laughs> over the Constitution. And we had seen them in the debate over neutrality. And we saw them in the arguments over the democratic societies and the whiskey rebels. And now this has become a, a practice that's well engineered now. So it doesn't take much. And the expectation is when there's a major public event, there are going to be rallies for or against. The anti-treaty rallies were filled with anger and vitriol. Uh, Blair McClenahan, who was a Philadelphia Republican, uh, stood up at a Philadelphia rally and said, held up a copy of it and said, what a damned treaty. I make a motion that every good citizen in this assembly kick this damned treaty to hell. And McClenahan's um, uh, words were cheered by the crowd. He burned the treaties, burned the newspapers that carried it, burned Jay and Effigy. Uh, there was a story which is probably apocryphal, but it's such a good story I'm going to tell it anyway, where Jay once said that he could have made his way up and down the eastern seaboard at night by the light cast by himself being burned in effigy that there were enough places where Jay was being burned in effigy that he, could, he wouldn't need lights. He could travel at night just based on the light of himself being burned in effigy that way. The outpourings of opposition were genuine because from everything we've talked about, Republicans hated this treaty. They hated the idea of it. They hated the contents of it. And they hated most of all the fact that it reestablished that very strong tie with the British, the Treaty of Amity and Commerce. But the Republican opposition was not just spontaneous. It didn't just grow up as this grassroots activism. Republican operatives, again, who had been at this for a while, led by Bache, led by John Beckley, who was one of Madison and Jefferson's top lieutenants, printed and distributed copies of the treaty. They hired writers, postal writers, or uh, mail writers, rather, uh, horseback writers, rather, to carry the copies of the treaty up and down the eastern seaboard to get them to cities, to get them to rallies. They coordinated plans for protest meetings. They shared language for anti-treaty petitions. One of the things you'll notice if you read a lot of those anti-treaty petitions from 1795, which I've done, is there's a stunning similarity between them. Because, and that's intentional. It's not just that people in different parts of the country spontaneously came up with the same wording for the protest. They were clearly copying from each other. And these protests and petitions made the Anti-Federalist Treaty Campaign a very well-coordinated, multi-state, interstate political campaign to try to defeat the treaty. Because remember, Washington had not yet signed it. And until he signed it, it would not take effect. And so the hope of these protests was to try to convince George Washington that it's too unpopular to sign, that it's a bad treaty on its merits, that he should either send Jay back to redo it or send somebody else back to redo it, but to defeat this, uh, th this treaty by withholding his signature from it. After all, they said the Senate barely approved it and rejected one of the articles. Why not go ahead and do the right thing and not sign the treaty? Federalist, again, realized this is not what we hoped for. It's not as good as we were looking for, but it's the best we have. It meets most of our objectives and it's the best we can do at the time. And so the Federalist essentially kind of swallowed hard and said, we've got to protect this, we've got to defend this treaty because it's all we've got. We don't want to go back and send a second mission back. That won't do any better for us in terms of results. And so the Federalist in July of 1795 also began to take to the streets and also began to take to the newspapers. They also began to go out and campaign and speak out in favor of the treaty. And Federalists were careful about how they defended it. They didn't say, this is great, it's wonderful, it cures all our ills. But they did say, look, it's the best that can be done. We get the forts back, finally. We get more trade and recognition um, from the British. We have some statement of firm friendship and amity and commerce between our two nations. Those are all good things. We've reestablished peace between our two nations. This is exactly what we wanted. And if we didn't get everything else we wanted, that's understandable given the situation. Federalists took to campaigning both in newspapers, as they had long done. Uh, Hamilton authored a, um, a series of 38 essays, which he co-authored with Rufus King, um, 
Hamilton had rejected King as a possible Publius in 1787, um, but by 1796, either he was more desperate or he thought Rufus King had improved as a polemicist because he was happy to add King on board uh, for the uh, uh, Camillus essays that he wrote, uh, also called the Defense Essays, 38 of them. Again, Hamilton never wrote five, es five essays when he could have written 38. Um, and so Hamilton wrote 38 essays. Actually, he wrote 28, and King wrote the other 10. But these were published in the newspapers as well. But Hamilton, the Federalist, also engaged in popular politics. Uh, Hamilton, rather famously, speaking at a meeting in New York, was actually uh, attacked by stones and hit in the head pretty, uh, pretty seriously in one of these attacks. Um, one, uh, one Federalist said that the crowd, the mob, was trying to even the playing field by knocking out Hamilton's brains so that he would be on the same brainless level as all the people in the mob. Um, but Hamilton and others, again, stood up and faced down the crowds of often virulent opposition to speak out in favor of the treaty, again, very carefully, being careful not to overpromise it or oversell it, but to simply say, you've got to remember the circumstances. The overall goal is peace and security and stability, and this treaty will give us those things. It's not great, but 10 years from now, we can get more. And 10 years after that, we can get even more. But we can't get to those unless we do this right now. And so this, again, was designed by Federalists to build public support because Washington seemed to be truly undecided. He had not yet signed it, was not yet willing to commit himself to this. And so this public display was not just to express opposition and support for the treaty, but the main goal was in many ways to persuade Washington to sign or not to sign uh, this treaty. So that summer of 1795 saw a massive newspaper campaign and a massive campaign in public spaces to try to mobilize public opinion for and against the treaty. Um, Washington was displeased with the public furor. This always upset him to see Americans arguing with each other this way in the streets, the same way they had argued in his own cabinet. And despite his disappointments with the measure, Washington finally, on August 14th, signed the treaty. On August 14th, Washington finally signed the treaty which led to another stage in the Jay Treaty protest, a little bit calmer, but one which still sparked great opposition. And for signing the treaty, Washington was attacked bitterly, as he had really never been attacked to that point before. The Republican press went after him. They had always gone after Hamilton and Federalist policies, but now they specifically went after George Washington himself. He had a choice. He chose to sign the treaty, and this was, to their minds, a gross violation of what he should have done as president. Now, the next stage in the Jay Treaty debate had to do not so much with foreign policy, but again with this issue of constitutionalism and constitutional interpretation. Because the treaty had called for commissions to resolve some of those outstanding disputes between the U.S. and the British, those took money. And as we know, funding bills have to originate in the House. And so the House of Representatives, which is not included in the treaty process, was in fact involved in the treaty process indirectly now because of the need for funding these commissions. In this, the House Republicans believe they had a, uh, a wedge to use to embarrass the administration. They called on Washington to turn over his papers, to turn over Jay's instructions, all the correspondence back and forth, all the stuff the administration had internally that they had used in discussing and debating the treaty. The House said, before we can decide whether to fund these commissions or not, we need more information. So show us what you've got. Give us what you have, and we'll look this over. Washington considered this and rejected it. And he basically stood up and said, no, I'm not required to do this constitutionally. The House may do what it wants to do, but I am not required to turn over administration papers, executive orders, executive communications. Those are private. They belong to the president. And he very strongly asserted his power constitutionally as president in rejecting the House claims for all the papers on the Jay Treaty. Well, you can imagine what happened. Federalists rallied behind Washington. 
this was another way of being able to put George Washington against the House Democratic Republicans and saying basically, who do you trust in this? And just enough Americans would still favor Washington to make that a winning play for the Federalist. Republicans in the House were aghast at this. How could he possibly refuse to give over this? He's behaving like the tyrant and the monocrat that we've been calling him. I mean, we used to think that was just political language we ginned up. We didn't believe it necessarily, but, but now we think it's true. He's actually behaving that way. How dare he do this and refuse to turn over to the House what we should have? Well, ultimately, the House debated the, not the merits of the treaty so much, but they debated the uh, funding of the commissions and whether or not to finally go ahead with that, which would be the next required step to make this happen. The debate over this was uh, one of great shifts and turns. Uh, there's a chapter in the book that deals with the numbers of congressmen who were appealed to through petitions and through pressure and through strong arming and through family ties and everything else that finally led to a shift of about uh, 14 or 15 congressmen who were probably against it, but who came around to vote for it for various reasons. And the treaty was finally approved in the House by a vote of 51 to 48. Again, not a whole lot of room to spare. 51 to 48 on April 30th of 1796. The House voted to fund those, th those commissions, the joint commissions, which would help put into effect the other elements of the treaty. On this, on this matter, um, the Jay Treaty debate was in many ways finally solved by the end of 1796 when the House finally joined the Senate to do what it needed to do to bring the treaty into effect. And so the Senate had ratified, Washington had signed, and now the House had voted to approve these commissions as well. But of course, the after effects of the treaty, and I just we'll talk about this briefly, and we can, can spend some more time on it if you want in the, the Q&A. But briefly, the post-treaty aftermath was like this. It did reestablish firmer ties between the U.S. and the British, which was exactly what Jay's treaty was supposed to do. It also firmed up support for both political parties. The debate over the Jay Treaty had been a year-long contest for public opinion, and the Federalists had been able to win converts to their side by the arguments that they made. They had strengthened their newspaper network. They had strengthened their ability to reach out to the public in rallies and gather support. And they had strengthened their ties to the British just as they had wanted to do. The Democratic Republicans also gained strength as well. For people who had opposed um, uh, neutrality, for people who had opposed the administration's position on the Democratic societies, they could now oppose the administration on the Jay Treaty matter as well. This became another of those major headline political issues that began to drive the American public into one camp or into the other. So the people had yet another issue to choose up sides on. And again, you begin to see some of the same patterns. People who are consistently favoring the Federalist position becoming Federalist. And those who've consistently favored the Democratic Republicans becoming more and more committed to the Democratic Republican side. So that was the immediate aftermath of the treaty. But what else was going on in the background, of course, was the jockeying for replacing George Washington, who did not want a second term and would not accept a third term. And he only very reluctantly took that second term. And like many presidential second terms often turn out to be, they weren't quite what they expected, like weren't quite what they hoped to be. And so for Washington in 1796, despite entreaties to run again, he declined to do so. And so the next big political event after the Jay Treaty debate would be, of course, the election of 1796 the first contested election for the American presidency in 1796. But the other thing that was an aftermath of the Jay Treaty was, of course, what this did to American relations with France. The treaty did firm up the relationship and the amity and the strong ties with England. It did reestablish that friendship. It did put those countries on a firmer trading basis and a firmer commercial basis and reestablish those ties between the two nations. But it infuriated the French. And what happened after 1796, after the Jay Treaty went into effect, is that the French began to attack American ships as much as the British had ever done themselves. 
they began to seize American ships. They began to impress American sailors. They began to steal cargoes. They began to detain ships. They began to deny America's neutral rights as a trading partner in the world. The French felt betrayed again. Neutrality, many Frenchmen thought, the Neutrality Proclamation had betrayed the American commitment in the peace treaty in the Alliance of 1778. And now the Jay Treaty had been another betrayal, another slap in the face. It had abandoned that 1778 treaty and basically ab abandoned the American-French ties to link the U.S. very closely with the British. And so the French, who were now engaged in a war, they had a war to win. They needed to follow whatever means necessary to try to defeat the British. And that meant stopping American ships and seizing cargoes and materials. And this ramping up of French attacks on American ships led, of course, to American diplomats being sent in the Adams administration to France to try to work out some terms to, come to, to, to bring an end to those practices, which led to the request for donations and contributions and emoluments and things like that, which led to the XYZ affair, which you all know about and we teach in our textbooks and things, which led to a heightened state of tension between the U.S. and France, which is often called the quasi-war. Again, suggesting that it's not actually a shooting war, but we're close enough. We detest the French, we detest what they do, and then, of course, it went so far under the Adams administration for the U.S. to put together a provisional army to defend against a potential French invasion, which Washington was going to come out of retirement to head with Hamilton as a second in command. And all of this, again, was designed to be a way of getting the U.S. to pressure the French to back down from this. But that rise in tensions between U.S. and France was a direct result of the Jay Treaty. And so for that reason, the Jay Treaty and the Jay Treaty debate were both, I think, two of the most significant events of the 1790s in diplomatic history, in foreign policy, in political parties and their rise, and in the changing international scene as well as the U.S. tried to navigate between those two hostile powers uh, in the 1790s. So with that, I'll stop what I'm saying, and we can talk about whatever you want to say, or we can have John weigh in with some points. We can uh, broach a number of issues here. And Tim, remind me when we want to quit and get on to the next session. We're scheduled for 45. Okay. Yeah, well, the other thing, too, about the Jay Treaty and the, the Pinckney Treaty is, is designed also to resolve some of those unresolved issues from the Jay Gardoki Treaty that we talked about yesterday, because the Pinckney Treaty ends up negotiating for access to the Mississippi, which the U.S. under Jay Gardoki had agreed to forbear for uh, 30 years or so. And the Pinckney Treaty comes along and sort of cleans that up. So the Pinckney Treaty is enormously popular, because it's very clearly, if the Jay Treaty is not very favorable to the U.S., but as strong as it could have gotten at the time, the Pinckney Treaty is really very favorable to the U.S., and particularly for many Southerners in the U.S. And what the Washington administration did was to submit the two treaties right on top of each other, basically. So the very popular Pinckney Treaty is there, and they could say, well, you know, we need the Jay Treaty as well. Let's put both these together and resolve all these issues. So I think in that sense, the Pinckney Treaty and the Jay Treaty do fit very closely together there. And again, the Federalist sort of had these two treaties to deal with, one pretty unpopular and the other very popular. And again, they, they sort of tried to lump them both in together and say, pay attention to the Pinckney Treaty, pay no attention to the Jay Treaty down here, but, but make sure you support that as well. So I think those two are, are very closely linked. And again, the point I would make about both those is just note how much of 1790s diplomacy is taking care of unfinished business from the 1780s and from the American Revolution. So much of what these diplomats have to do in the first decade under the new national government is to go back and clean up issues or readdress things or resolve issues that were still unresolved or still hanging over from the revolutionary conflict and from the 1780s. And I think that there's a real era, uh, real era, uh, era of unfinished business in 1790s diplomacy that we see with Jay and the Pinckney Treaty um, and, and a number of other negotiations as well. Did the British get anything in Jay's treaty other than, I don't know, a tilt in friendship? Um, 
Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, they they held so many cards anyway that what what the U.S. could have given them was not that great, except for this pledge of of neutrality, of friendship, and peace, and trade, which in time of war is obviously very important. And with the projection that the United States will become uh, more producing, more wealthy, have more value over time, that's a that's a valuable benefit. So the U.S. didn't have a whole lot to to, to do to help the British. That's why, again, this was a treaty that was far more important to the U.S. than to the British. But I guess the key thing the British got from it was that pledge of, of amity and friendship that restored those ties and, and the promise of that strong commercial relationship, which the thinking was in the future would be much more valuable than, than it was at the time. Um, did the Jay Treaty uh, solve the issue of um, loyalist debt? Uh, loyalist debt, something like that? Not to everyone's satisfaction. And the other thing it did not resolve was the compensation for carrying off slaves that were taken during the Revolution. And if you remember back to the Jay Gardoki Treaty, Southerners were furious with Jay over that treaty because he seemed to give away access to the Mississippi. Some Southerners were also furious with Jay for the Jay Treaty because they thought he didn't push hard enough to win compensation for slave owners who lost their property during the Revolution. And again, their argument was, Jay's a northerner. We know he's anti-slavery. Of course, he's not going to push very hard for this. So part of the opposition to Jay's treaty from many southerners came on those grounds. That, that Not so much that it was um, uh, a sellout to Great Britain, but that Jay, because of who he was and where he came from, was negotiating as a northeasterner. And his concerns were not those of southerners and westerners. And of course, they said, we should have known he would do this. He did this 10 years earlier during Jay Gardoki when Southerners were convinced that he was too quick to give away access, to bargain away access uh, to the Mississippi. How long did it take for the British to leave the ports? I think they actually, in some cases, kept their word. I think by June 1st of 1796. But I mean, one of the, uh, there are two, two other arguments corollary to the occupation, so it's not just the embarrassment that's there, mm -hmm. it's also the influence on Indians uh, in the area and the fur trade mm -hmm. uh, that the British have monopoly on American territory. Mm -hmm. And obviously the influence on Indians is just one of the major reasons for the War of 1812. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and both of those are very important because they're both still very prevalent by the 1790s. And we tend to think of the fur trade as being earlier but it, it extended for a time, and certainly the problem with, with natives in the, in, the, in the region, particularly the, what's now the Midwest, um, that was, again, very much a pressing issue in the 1790s and the source of sort of unending wars uh, against them uh, in, in, at that time. What was the Republican view for the quasi-war? Was that embarrassment for them as well? Yeah, I mean, this was a place where uh, I think in some ways people of both parties could actually come to agreement on the, the insult of demanding a bribe and the insult of uh, what they considered French treachery at the time. It was deeply embarrassing for the, for the Republicans, certainly, as being longtime supporters of, of, of France. But I think this was also something that Americans could come together on and agree this was outrageous. Where they differed was on what to do about it and the idea of do we need to put an army together and call Washington out of retirement to lead this? Is there going to be a French invasion? Many Republicans said that's nonsense, but they, they certainly would have objected as they did to uh, the efforts to try to demand bribes to, to do business and the insult that that was to Americans. So that, that sort of gave partisans of both sides a chance to, to come together, but it's significant that uh, that really only happened briefly because very quickly it turned to, let's think about an army, let's think about who's going to command it. Here comes Hamilton again, who's out of influence with Adams, and now suddenly this is going to be a way to ride Washington's coattails again and come back in power as his second in command. So very quickly, I think it turned into, um, uh, back into a partisan, partisan conflict, which is why, again, I think it's just impossible to think about foreign policy in the 1790s without that partisan context. I just, I just see it everywhere, and I think it influences how people think and see and understand it 
So you clearly have diplomatic foreign policy issues, but those always, I think, get filtered through the lenses of, of domestic politics, which are becoming stronger and stronger uh, over that time. One of the three American commissioners that go to France in the XYZ affair is Elbridge Gary, yeah. uh, a substitute, and he's a very close friend of the president, mm -hmm. and he's a Democratic Republican. Mm -hmm. And when the whole thing collapses, uh, Pinckney and uh, Marshall return as heroes, and uh, Gary stays there. And he is attacked roundly by everybody for staying there. And what what is he doing there? Uh, is he giving away uh, American interests? Uh, the president is very concerned. Abigail Adams is very concerned, this friend of theirs. Uh, and he stood up and uh, supported him in appointing him to go there when he was the enemy, mm -hmm. the Democratic Republican. Uh, and, and so uh, you, you get some attack upon Democratic Republicans because their man is undercutting uh, yeah. what is going on in this movement for war, which was sort of the declaration of war was the XYZ affair. Right. And uh, little did they know that their, their, own, their own man, the Federalist, the president, is the one who stops the war from happening. Yeah. Did the French Revolution help the United States get more favorable terms in the Pinckney Treaty because that family tie between France and Spain was broken with the death of Louis? I don't know. It's a great, that's a great question. I'm, I'm not sure how important that factor was when looked at in the, the sort of broader overall geopolitical factors. Um, but clearly, I mean, that's a, that's a very good reminder of, again, how the United States never sort of has a clear shot at dealing even with its own continent in the 1780s and 90s, because there's always the British, the French, and the Spanish in some way are, are connected here. And that's, again, one of the reasons why all these treaties have an impact on this, this very complicated relationship. I think I used the phrase yesterday that they, they, the U.S. was always being buffeted uh, in, in the world in the 1780s and 90s. And that's a very good illustration, again, of, of why. I mean, it's never a simple matter of let's deal with this country and that country. It all tends to be interrelated, and one has an effect on the other. And again, the Jay Treaty cemented the relationship with the British but it infuriated the French in ways that, that very quickly led to the quasi-war after that. Yeah, I would say that the, the French are not happy with the Americans here at oh, that yeah. time with the Pinckney yeah. Treaty. Yeah. So I don't know that they'd be uh, assisting the, the Spanish. But I think that what's, what's happening is that the, the, the Spanish are getting weaker and the Americans are getting stronger. Mm -hmm. Just the thing that uh, Jay predicted back in 86, mm -hmm. that give us 25 years or so, we can go down and take it over. Yeah. And so I, I think the, the Spanish are uh, aware of the growing strength of the Americans, and they can't be so demanding here. Mm -hmm. And I think also Nootka Sound has some impact, mm -hmm. uh, because uh, there was, the Americans were uh, combining with the, maybe they combined with the, the English and allowing the English to come down in the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, those are more positive uh, impacts, I think, for the Spanish. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's always like this notion with American history that like we had the advantage of being isolated from European affairs largely. <laughs> Would you say that's a misnomer? <laughs> yes, <laughs> in a word. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're right. I mean, and that was some people thought would be a great strength of the U.S. is that they've got these walls of water, they were later called, um, that, that would supposedly cut that off. But as we know from the colonial period, into and through the revolution afterwards, it's really not that way. I mean, as we've said, all these other European nations have those ties in the United States, and that doesn't end with independence. It doesn't end with the Constitution. I mean, that, that's, that keeps going, and that creates any number of issues that have to be resolved either diplomatically uh, or militarily. So the sense that they would be cut off or isolated there, I think um, uh, David yesterday talked about the, the sort of myth that the U.S has nothing to do with the world until 1898, and then the U.S. can't stay out of the world after 1898, uh, is just clearly wrong on that first half of it. I mean, the U.S. is, is drawn deeply into it um, for all those reasons of the overlapping claims and jurisdictions and everything else. Yeah, Greg? I'm stuck on that Article 12 thing. Does anybody have any idea how big a 70-ton ship is? 
Because if it's a commerce treaty, yeah, and the commerce is so lucrative, it would seem like it's silly to reject that that provision of it, mm -hmm. unless is it like the glorified rowboat that is so insulting <laughs> nobody would possibly ever do that. Or it's like the size of a small. Yeah, you go. <coughs> yeah. yeah. So I don't want to sleep. It's not, no. not, not a nautical guy. It's, a, it's not a big. Not a big ship. So nobody would ever, no self-respecting merchant would ever take a 70-ton ton ship? Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it really limits how much you can carry and how many trips you have to make and stuff like that. So it's designed to give the U.S. access, but in a very limited way, which doesn't really help the U.S. that much. It's not really a concession by the British. Um, and that 70 tons thing was just considered an insult because, again, I, I don't know, I'm not a nautical person either, but uh, 70 tons was considered um, compared, I don't, I don't know what the size of others would be, how many tons other ships would be, but that was considered a very smaller one. So that kind of access would, would really restrict the, how many boats might go and, and, uh, and what you could do. Nobody would go, right? <laughs> well, since it was rejected, yeah. I mean, you wouldn't have access to that, but, but yeah, the, the, the idea was even if it was approved, <clears throat> it still wouldn't lead to much in the way of trade. <clears throat> so you'd have, in theory, yes, we've got access to the West Indies, but the reality is, in such a small way, it just wouldn't make a difference.